So our uh, oldest, Harrison, uh, learned to read very early. I'm, I'm saying it was probably started somewhere around maybe three and a half or four. And he picked up on it pretty fast. He he learned to to gain words by kind of memorizing the words, I think, if I remember right, something like that. But he was reading books, like he picked the Harry Potter series. We we loved that series at the time. I can remember the excitement around each book that would come out and he would just chew them up basically as far as reading them and getting them done quickly. And and I was just so um, amazed he was a, he was an amazing kid all my all my kids are actually and so he learned very quickly how to how to read and was doing it very early so when our second child came along abby i thought well you know at about three three and a half i thought well you know we should we should be re getting her to read you know it's time you know harrison was at three why can't she be at three and so i you know I started to, of course, we always read to our kids uh, every night. We had a, we would read stories, some stories we'd have to read over and over and over again, but we would read to them. And I think that's where they got the joy of reading was from us reading to them. But when Abby came along, I figured she needed to start reading at about three. So I, I was trying to put books in front of her. I was trying to get her to start reading. And I remember approaching you, Gina, and saying, you know, don't you think it's about time she starts to read? We need to get some books and get it in front of her and do some, you know. And I remember you saying, no, you know, we will start when she is ready to take it on. Well, of course, <laughs> I didn't believe that. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So I would, I, I would try to go in there and say, okay, come on, let's try to, you know, and I would try to get her to do it. And I, I didn't do too much of that, but, um, as as you said, it was when she was ready, she would read. And so for her, I think it started when she was about five, if I remember somewhere around there, maybe a little five and a half. So she would she started to get some interest. Once she got interest in it, then she, she was she was the same way. She was just gobble them up and, and read them. Uh, and she read the Harry Potter books and all that. So it, it kind of showed me. Uh, you know, how important it is to address, you know, learning by when they're ready to learn whatever it is they need to learn, whether it's reading English, math, whatever, is to to wait. And, and so I, it was a good lesson for me. And, and so on the third child, I know I kind of, I let, <laughs> I let her do it as she was ready. Uh, I didn't try to push it. So. Well, hello, this is Gina. And this is Don with Focused Healthy Family. And this is podcast number 56. And today we're talking about child led learning. But before we get started on that topic, let's hear a word from our sponsor. And we're back. So today we're doing something different. We're going to talk about child led learning and the and important. For our audience out there to understand that Gina and I right now are, are in two separate locations. So we, we usually do this together. So there may be a little bit of uh, hesitations here and there because we we, we don't cue ourselves as well with uh, being remote. And some glitchiness as I'm hearing a lag and, um, but we'll work through it anyhow. So child yeah. learning, what is that? What does that mean? What does it look like? Is it just for homeschoolers? We do homeschool our kids and we kind of got into that because our oldest, like you described, um, was it kind of advanced as far as, yeah, he didn't really sound out words. He memorized, you told him what a word was and he remembered what it looked like. And <laughs> so he was able to put a lot of words together at a young age and then able to read. I remember you doing phonics with all of the kids. And some oh, yeah. kids <laughs> sounded out. Our youngest was able to do that. Our oldest, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not at all. His was, he just literally memorized words. And these are all valid different ways of learning. And it's important that we work to our strengths. Think about yourself. If you haven't, like, I've been learning to crochet new stitches and be able to expand upon the um, the initial scarves that I made and 
And I learn best by watching a YouTube video and going along <laughs> and pausing it. You know, there are patterns that describe the stitches. I can't follow that. I learn best by watching the video and I'll slow it down and pause it. And I've learned from a YouTuber who is um, British. And so I've learned the UK terms. And so it throws me off when I hear yeah. the American. Did you learn how to talk like that too? <laughs> well, they have different terms. A double crochet is a treble crochet and it's, it's confusing. Well, and you remember with, with our oldest, I think where it really started was street signs. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I think I started with with him because I was home a little more than you were. I was home uh, for our church sound. You were home, I think, more with the second one. And you would do the same thing. You would take the stroller with both of them and go around and always okay. talk about the street signs. You're taking credit for the street signs because I remember. Oh, well. <laughs> I remember he was an infant and I would walk him. And I would just describe what I saw as we walked. Okay. There's a mailbox. There's a tree. And so I did it before he was born. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did it uh, before we were even married. I had, <laughs> I'm curling my hair, by the way. So. <laughs> There's a fun little sketch on SNL with Kristen Wiig where they kind of outdo each other on things. So before we ramble on and on a little more, I'd like to read part of... Um, a blog post I wrote. I have a blog called Child Led Learning. It's a WordPress blog. And I write all about different types of topics related to children and learning. And so I'm going to read from this things I have learned from my children. Um, That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I pause. <Pauses>. <laughs> I printed the page and I didn't realize that at first there's all the tags before you get to. So I quoted um, the song, teach them well. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us how we used to be. So I find beauty and truth in this song. I am familiar with Whitney Houston's version, yet my research found that it was written by Michael Masser and the late Linda Creed in 1976. So I believe the children are our future. I also believe that I have learned far more from my children than I could have ever teach them. My children have reminded me of who I truly am. Living alongside of them, I have found my way back to my true self. It is a journey. It is a process. I know my children have helped me along my journey. I believe our souls are connected. On a spiritual level, we guide each other and have connections far beyond our current human condition. I have learned many things from my children and I continue to learn more every day. I have been a mother for over 25 years and look forward to all I will continue to learn from my children throughout our current lifetime together. And then I just literally list I, a list of things that I have learned from my children. So I'll read a couple of these and then we can discuss. Stop and slow down and pay attention to the things around you. Slow down. <laughs> Reading together before bed is a good habit. Eat when you are hungry and sleep when you are tired. Hugs and kisses are good medicine. Laughter is the best medicine. Follow your passion. And I'm going to pause there. Well, and that, that last one is really important because that's really what this is about is following the passion, you know. And, and like, even if your kids go to school, giving them the opportunity mm -hmm. to explore something that they have an interest in. And it doesn't have to look like a formal class, you know, with the internet. It can look like researching together with them letting them find out information and listening, letting them share with you what they're learning, giving them opportunities to be around the interest, whatever it is. Um, if it's photography, if it's theater, you know, acting, attending plays, going to places that have these different types of opportunities. <laughs> 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 Over my over my words. Um, 
But, you know, we learn best when we're interested in what we're learning. And I love mm. this. I love this quote. It says, um, forcing children to learn when they're not interested is like throwing marshmallows at their head and calling it eating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like that though. It's kind of fun. That would be fun. Mess that up slightly, but yeah, we're not taking when we're not engaged and interested in what we're learning. How much do we take in? Well, and I also, you know, I, I would add experiencing too. You know, giving them the experience of being enwrapped in something. You know, I, I think uh, this is it's like going to uh, to places and doing things was part of that learning too. You know. Um, going to the nature center and experiencing the animals there, or the the wildlife things that they had there, that experience is so much more powerful than even words can be. Sure, yeah. I remember I was reading about some program or some class where kids could learn about, you know, fish and aquatic life. And I was at that point, our daughter had gone to Florida twice, once with her aunt and swam with dolphins. And then she went with the Girl Scout troop and swam with the manatees. And I remember thinking, you know, that's so much better than reading a book about these same topics. We did a lot of field trips and the kids were younger and we did it as a group. We went with other friends and maybe they weren't interested in the field trip we attended, but if they were, we could take it further. We could learn more. We could dive in deeper into it. And realizing that, you know, school is set up to be able to educate a lot of kids in a restricted space with restricted resources and trying to meet the needs of a lot of different kids at one time when all of us learn differently. We have different strengths and different different weaknesses. And I totally forgot what I was going <laughs> to <laughs> A lot of gaps here today. <laughs> mm. Well, you know, and I think it, it's been helpful um, being, being so involved in, in their wanting to do these things and that, you know, it wasn't just we, we, said, okay, go do this or, or send them off somewhere. You know, we were doing it there with them. We were in, we were enveloping ourselves in it too, as well as, you know, them and getting involved. Parents, and many parents are You're active yeah. in kids' school, attending field trips, attending other activities with them. And I guess where I was going with my point was realizing we all have different strength, strengths and different ways of learning. And that's why some kids, it helps to have a tutor for them to learn something one-on-one -on -one that they might be struggling with in school or having some extra activities to enhance that and give them those opportunities. And before I forget, I want to say it's also important that kids have downtime. The kids have time to be bored. <laughs> it's so easy to be overscheduled and go from school to, you know, after school activity, whether it's robotics or gymnastics or a sport or clubs and activities. And then you've got gatherings with families and, you know, they can have so much of their time scheduled. Yeah. Well, and... the, the, the quiet time allows them to think and, and doubt and question and, and explore. And not just quiet, but yeah, that you know. Well, yeah, topics, just their own time. Going outside and just playing with neighbors and making things up. Boredom fosters creativity and curiosity and being able to explore and, you know, a kid who takes something apart. You know, you can get angry at them that they just dismantled the clock or the computer or whatever. Or you can provide them with the opportunity to explore like, oh, you like taking things apart. You know, well, in the future, I'd like you to ask me before you take this apart. But before, you know what? I, next I think, time, before you take the car apart, <laughs> <laughs> you want to read more from your list? Why, sure. So things I have learned from my children. Be who you are and don't apologize for it. 
speak the truth, speak your truth. How we talk to people matters as much as what we say to them. Respect is a two-way street. If you love to dance, then dance as much as you can. Reading a great book is more fun when you read along with friends. And Satoshi Tajiri created Pokemon. <laughs> so, we probably, you probably put in that list about Toyota too and who uh, started Toyota. <laughs> we did some different activities, some on our own, <clears throat> some with a group of friends. We were in kind of cooperative learning opportunities with friends from a young age. And we participated in an activity where each family took a different country and learned different things about mm. it. And we presented these ideas that we've learned with the rest of the group. And because of our love of Pokemon, even though most of the kids in our group loved Pokemon, somehow we got to pick Japan and we learned to count to three in Japanese. And <laughs> We learned about Satoshi Tajiri and we learned about Pokemon and we learned things about Japanese culture. And at the time, the kids were five and nine. So there were some basic things that we learned. We, I remember checking books out from the library and then we made a poster. And I still remember we're in like a church, you know, open area building and Abby and Harrison are standing up at the table with their poster board standing upright. And Abby had some kind of pointer. Now she's five years old. And I remember thinking, <laughs> she's going to be a teacher someday. And she was describing things and she was pointing at things and talking about what we learned. And, and that's what I remember most from that is just how she thrived in that having the ability to teach others, right? We, when we can teach others something, it helps us to learn it even more. Well, and Harrison, we, our oldest was one that... Um he would take on a subject on his own and just dig up everything. That's why I mentioned Toyota, because I remember he got in this uh, kind of this fixation, maybe, I don't know if I, that's not, that's kind of a strong word, but about Toyota and finding out everything about who started because, it. And, you know, because we had purchased a new to us Toyota minivan. Yeah. He was young, and yeah. so he became very interested in it. And I remember going to the library and the book he had reserved online was there. And he jumped up and down because the history of the Toyota Motor Corporation book was with <laughs> He was about eight, if I remember right. And so, you know, homeschooling gave us the opportunity to allow him to pick a topic like that and dive into it. School divides, that's what I was going with my prior topic when I lost my train of thought. School divides learning into subjects, you know, English, math, social studies, science. It's very specific. We're going to learn this now and we're going to learn this now. But in reality, when you learn something, it's not easily categorized into a specific subject. Oh, Natural learning and, you know, learning about the history of Toyota is learning about cars. He started um, subscribing to Motor Trend magazine. Again, this is an eight-year-old. Well, that was uh, somebody gave him a. I think my sister or something gave him a subscription to it. He had something an like interest. In that. Yeah, he's reading this book on the history of the company. I mean, there's reading, there's English, there's history, there's social studies. There's so many different elements going on there, and. You know, like I was saying before, the school is set up in a way that we can facilitate learning for a lot of, of kids at one time. And there's a place for that. And there's a reason that the school came about the way it is. And yet there are challenges to that. And there are components of it that do not work in our kids' best interest, like a child who wants to really delve into one area and spend the time on it, they often don't have that opportunity to. And to be able to explore that and not have to worry about, oh, I gotta you know, get my math homework done. I, I gotta get all this you know, done at the same time too. And so, you know, how do you do this if your kids are in school? Because this is like we talk about with all our skills with parenting, it doesn't matter if you're, child is a newborn, 
if they're 15 or even if they're 25. We can always foster improved relationships with our kids and we can always improve on the that love of learning and that ability to follow through. <clears throat> well, I, I would so oh, I, I would think it's again it goes back to parent involvement and, and then being able to, you know, take what they're learning at school and steer it towards their some type of a passion of theirs you know if if they're learning about uh i don't know german culture or something but they they've been given something to read about it you might find a a, a video on it or a, to also give them an because they learn better by watching sometimes than reading you might do something like that and then help them to do the reading part of it but you know, it would enhance it by doing something that they that they have more interest in, but on that same subject or some. You know, does that? I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it does. And also remembering that if it, we take over this interest and we're like, oh, you need to do this and you need to read this and let's play this game now and let's do this, you're kind of messing with that natural curiosity and that natural rhythm. Yeah providing the resources, giving them the opportunity. I would often check books out. Our middle child got interested in poetry and I went to the library and checked out some different poetry books and gave her the opportunity to look at them. I didn't coerce her to read any of them. I simply said, here are some books, you know, we gave the opportunity to look at them herself or look at them together. And maybe I returned them three weeks later and maybe she didn't even open one of them. But giving those opportunities to them we have to give back our kids an opportunity to take charge of themselves in their life. Our kids are being told what to do, when, how, with whom, from a very young age. And so it's no wonder that they are seeking a sense of control. And this can come out as a behavior challenge, a kid goofing around in school, not getting things done. They want a sense of control in their lives. You know, why else do kids, when they get older, they skip school or do other things? They want to decide how they're spending their time. And so they need that opportunity to. And so, like I said, making sure their life is not overscheduled, that even if it's something, you know, they really want to do, if you don't have some downtime, if you don't, can't take a day off and just have pajama day or be able to step away from things for a little while, it's gonna quickly lead to increased stress and anxiety, burnout, and you know, all well, kinds of- Tears at the relationship too of a parent and a child because they, they want to do, they want the control and you're not giving it to them, they're going to take it or try to take it. And yeah, which is causes a, a rift between the two of you, you know, or the- all- a sense of control in our lives and so having those opportunities to do that i remember you saying to me one time i think with our oldest when i don't know how old he was eight or ten you know shouldn't you be assigning him things to read and i remember thinking he loves reading i don't want to ruin that <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well like i tried to do with abby <laughs> you know he loves it and so i didn't feel the need you know he joined a book club club when he was around that age. And so he read the books that were part of the book club because he enjoyed doing that. He went on to go to community college and read the required reading. Yet at such a young age, no, I didn't want to. A kid who yeah. already loved reading and loved going to the library, you know, I would suggest maybe new things or, you know, check something out that could be outside of his interest to expand things. Um, Yet forcing him to do something seemed counterproductive to me. Well, and, and that kind of goes along, you know, what, like overall, what I, what I, what I see with the childhood learning, which I, I find amazing, is because we've given our children this opportunity, because we have let them lead us in how they wanted to learn, I, I've been amazed, especially by our youngest now, who who is doing so much stuff on her own and coming down and, and she'll come down and tell me about this, you know, well, like something she programmed, you know, she's made up a game, a program game. 
And I'm like, ah, you, you did that. How did you? She said, well, I watched some YouTube and I, I read some stuff and, and I, they want to learn and they do it. They, they, they explore on their own. There, there was no, I didn't push her to do that. I didn't even know she was doing that. <laughs> and, you know, uh, that was amazing to me. And it just kind of tells me, well, one, I give kudos to you, Gina, because when I, I remember when we started this homeschooling thing, I thought, oh my gosh, this is voodoo, you know, because like, both, well, both of us come from that background of having to go to school, you know, when, uh, you know, my all that, a, you know, all that, co- yeah, the, yeah, all that, that structure that we went through and all that, it was really hard for me to, to take this on and go, we're not we're not doing school how 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 are they going to learn you know all those doubts and questions and fears even came out but over time when when they do those things like that like coming down with a something they've learned on their own and and it's amazing especially for i think the first time she did that she was pretty young i mean I, i can't remember probably maybe 10 or 11 maybe and i'm thinking my gosh you know I can't imagine anybody in school that's already got that kind of talent or, or you know, has been, uh, I don't know. It's it just an opportunity to pursue. Yeah. 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 Pursue that. And yeah. so it, it has really shown me over and over. Cause I mean, she wasn't the only one that, I mean, uh, Abby did it, Harrison did it all. You know, they all did these amazing things on their own, you know, just cause they were curious and that curiosity took them into a place of exploring and wanting to do something. Um, and it just, I don't know, it just find it amazing again and, and really helped kind of prove me wrong, I guess, in a way, uh, which I'm happy to say that that that's good to prove me wrong in that, that area because it has paid off. The toughest part, I think, especially with our youngest, is she has a hard time seeing that um, – what where she is with stuff and how how smart and and talented she is because she's being told by some of her online friends of how they go to school and and she feels like that's supposed to be the way you're supposed to do it but yet she's doing it on her own and she just can't see it because it's not set up in that structure like she's been told that's the way to do it and at 14 don't we all question our lives and what things look like and we're uncomfortable and when you have an anxiety disorder on top of it yeah that questioning is natural and normal our oldest went through questioning at around that same age 15 or so of mom what have you done to me in my education and (laughs) it doesn't look like what other kids look like and and frustration and he went on to community college and he got his associate's degree and he's moving up in the company he works for and reflecting back, he's, you know, it's just kind of that questioning time. So no matter what's going on when kids are teenagers, that's part of their brain development is to question and challenge and, and doubt the way things have been done. And that's part of their learning. And well, that's critical to- thinking too. And we need to step out of the way and take of taking that personally and realize that's part of the process of, of what they're going through. Well, um, and, they, and they've also each uh, each one of our kids so far is really followed their passion into their job, which to me is is a is a I mean, I, I know Abby still has a ways to go because there's a lot to the, she loves what she does, but has, mm-hmm. you know, there's some things about the job itself is not as but she has an interest in dogs and a love of dogs and she's working for her aunt who's a dog trainer and runs a business with dog boarding and training and she's working there and living with a friend on her own three hours and functioning yeah is this what she's gonna do forever who knows i mean our son's assistant manager at best buy is he gonna do that forever who knows i mean how many different careers have you had done (laughs) <laughs> no, no, don't let's not go down that road. <laughs> I mean, we all change no, our no, I know. And we, and we change our path. You know, you got a degree in business wanting to go into marketing, right? Yeah. Is that correct? And you wound up in food service sales and then you got tired of traveling. Well, and even then- even deeper than that, when I was really small, one my my goal in life was to be a car designer. 
Okay. I, I loved everything about cars. I, well, you remember, I have that scrapbook of where I used to cut out all the latest cars each year, you know, and, you know, then I went in, I ended up in web design. So I was in design. It just wasn't necessarily about cars, but so, you know, I did, I, in a way, I kind of followed my passion in a way uh, from what something when I was really, you know, well, now that I think about it, <laughs> if, if it's okay, um, you know, I also, I remember as a kid, raised Catholic, mom always wanted us to be a priest and all this stuff. I didn't really want to be a priest except for the sermons. I wanted to be the one, I loved the priest that would give a cool sermon and would talk to us, you know, and now look at, I'm at a place where I'm, I'm working on being a speaker. So I, I guess in a way, Didn't you what's say, that? Stand up at home and give sermons. <laughs> Standing behind this big, um, we had a window fan. It was, I, it was big, but I was small at the time. So I, it was probably not as big as I am imagining now, but I could, I, I would stand and it'd be right at the right level. It was like a pulpit for me or something, you know, and I would preach the heck out of myself, you know. Uh, mom, what's that? Reach into the van. Yeah, that's right. That's right. No, it's right. <laughs> anyway, sorry, a little drift off there, but it, it does talk about passions, and I think that's a really important part of what we're talking about is this idea that we're we're letting them develop their their passion of what they like and want to be and do and, and all that. And I think that's allowing really important. Change your mind and allowing it to look differently along the way and not putting our expectations on it. Yeah. You know, you, I was trying to make the point that you evolved and you went into different careers yeah. and you did different things until you got where you are now. And that's okay. That's part of your journey. I had a yeah. love of as a kid. And I was doing things from elementary school. We did a, like a news podcast that aired on like the local TV channel. And I was on the writing crew of that. And then we moved, um, you know, I moved a couple of times growing up to different school districts. And I remember being, having a writing class in about sixth grade. And then I didn't have as many opportunities in high school with writing. And somehow that got put on the shelf. And because my education was so focused on science and math and going to college, um, and there wasn't a big push for writing in the 80s, the SATs didn't require any writing essays. And I wrote one paper in four years of high school. And um, there just wasn't a lot of time spent with writing. And so I found my way into the field of occupational therapy, and yet I've had to write as an occupational therapist. I have to write treatment notes and treatment plans, and I have continued to write privately on my own and journal and then found my way into blogging and writing on parenting and all these different topics. So it's always been there and um, seeing it evolve, speaking on hobbies and interests we grew up with homeschooling our children and learning about different styles of homeschooling. And one is called unschooling. So it's essentially not following structured curriculum or pattern that learning doesn't have to look like school. And so kind of along the lines of some of the things we've talked about, and I would go to some conferences. And I remember when my kids were still pretty young, hearing some grown unschoolers. So kids who had followed this, you know, non-traditional way of learning. And now they were teens or young adults. And someone asked them, you know, what are your hobbies? What do you do for fun? And I remember one kid saying, you know, well, you know, not be seeing what a hobby was per se, because they had followed the interest in what they enjoyed, what we might call a hobby. And they had found paid work along those lines. So every aspect of their life for the most part was something that they really enjoy doing. Now, sure, there are components of our life that we don't enjoy. Yeah. And it's not that you don't learn to, you know, clean up after yourself and do things you might not otherwise like to do. Yet, I just remember being struck with the fact that this kid was, you know, understood the concept of a hobby, yet was answering the question very in an unusual way because they had had the time to explore and do things that they enjoyed. And so they couldn't separate it out from their day-to-day -day life. And I, 
you know, I was inspired at this time by all these kids because I went to 12 years, well, 13 years of public school with kindergarten and went on to college because that's what you did when you graduated high school. It was not, <laughs> just not really yeah. another option. And my dad had worked his way through college had while well, being married and raising children. He attended night school for almost 10 years before he got his degree. And so he had instilled in us the importance of completing your education and he was going to pay for half of it. But we could not get married while we were in college. This was a stipulation. <laughs> I didn't know that. It was based on his experience and the, you know, the, 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 the struggle, the challenge it was for him doing yeah. that. Yet, yet he did it. And so you know, we've grown up in that environment. And so stepping outside of my comfort zone when it came to educating our own children, looking at new ways of doing things. And, you know, I, I wrote this post because I've learned so much from them and they have kind of led the way, you know, we all learn differently. All kids are differently. And we parent all the kids differently. There's no way to parent two kids exactly the same. I mean, even if you have twins, they have different personalities. I have some friends with twins. They have different strengths and weaknesses. One might be more introverted. One might be more extroverted. One might be more hands-on. One might be, you know, the quiet kid who wants to sit back and read. And we need to honor their differences and where they're at and really work towards their strengths. When we focus on the negative and what they're doing wrong, Think the law of attraction, you're going to put more energy into that. But how can we focus on the strengths and what they enjoy? Something as simple as a family movie night. If you've got multiple kids in the house, you rotate each week and a different person gets to pick what you're watching. You know, maybe you have an educational movie once a month or whatever, and you rotate the topic depending on what they're interested in. There's so many different ways of incorporating their interests and it's important we stop and give our kids some focus time, even if it's for 15 minutes and they want to explain to us for the hundredth time about all the Pokemon. And there are a lot. <laughs> they might have absolutely no interest in Pokemon <laughs> and be bored out of our mind by this. Yet we can say, you know what? My kid is interested in this. I'm going to learn a little something about it. I'm going to step into their world for a few minutes. And I can set a limit on it. I can say, okay, you know what? I've got to get something else done. I've got to start dinner, whatever. Um, you know, but I've got 15 minutes and put your phone down. Goodness, put your phone down and give them the attention or say, you know, I can't do it right now, but I want to hear more about this. You know, can you tell me about this over dinner or after dinner before I read you a story? And give them that, that opportunity to share with you what they're learning because we learn so much more when we can tell back what we've learned and when we have the opportunity to share what we're learning. Um, you know, and speaking to the different traits our kids have and how they can be very challenging when they're young. Um, the next thing in my list of things I've learned is persistence is challenging to parents, but it's valued by employers. So our youngest, I used to tell our youngest, our oldest, I used to tell him, if you look up persistent in the dictionary, your picture is there. <laughs> when he's insisting on that we're loading the dishwasher wrong or how we're supposed to do things at home or when he was young, it was challenging. And yet when he was doing his Eagle Scout project, he worked for a local high school and they wanted the side of the, they kind of had a hill alongside their football stadium and they wanted a big rock, um, mural of their school letters or whatever it was and they had a plan of how they wanted it and so he had to you know get funding for donations for the types of rocks and the paint and all the materials needed to do this project and I think you took him around to um some of these places yeah well, he 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 was well he is he's I think a natural born salesman in a way, but he's able, he got the rocks, he got the paint, he got everything donated that was needed. Um, but I, I mean, talk about persistent. I, I love the story with that. Cause that when we were, like you said, it, it was this circle. We had to first dig out this circle in the hill and then put what? rocks down. 
12 feet more 15 feet round it was, yeah probably 15 yeah it was big because they wanted their, their two letters of the school's name up there and we had to paint uh he wanted to paint the the, the school colors uh, it was a blue and white i think it was and so we were able to get somebody to uh loan us a a, a paint uh, sprayer to do it with and uh talk about persistence okay so he we got this spray, sprayer but the the place we had to plug it in was like up the hill and kind of back some way so we had to use like three ex, three or four extension cords to get to this painter which took the power down on it we didn't realize and so when we turn it on it would it would like trickle out like i mean i think i well i, I could probably pee harder than this thing sprayed out at that moment and i remember it, it was it was late it was like about seven or seven thirty, and it started getting dark, and he's up there trying, with this thing barely coming out, and trying to sp And I'm going, Harrison, we need to stop. We'll have to figure this out. No, no, Dad, we need to get this done. And he's up there just trickling out the water. I mean, the water barely pouring out of there. And I, I was like, and, painted it <laughs> and I had to, I had to just say, no, Harrison, stop. I had, in fact, I turned the machine off because the power was stretched out so much that it didn't give enough power to do it. So we had to do a little different uh, technique, but uh, and we got it painted, but that not that night. I mean, he was going to stay there. He was going to paint each one of those rocks with that little trickle of water, and there were a lot of rocks. I also remember he went somewhere to get a donation, and he just persisted so long that they they initially were not going to or didn't. I don't. I can't remember the exact story, but there was there was some. <sighs> If it was a local hardware store or something that he just persisted so much that they I remember them saying to him about you know you're just really persistent aren't you yeah and he well he never did you know he would not give up when we sold I remember when he used he would sell popcorn that was another thing he really enjoyed going around and we would take a wagon and load it full of popcorn and walk around neighborhoods and I remember this one guy because I taught I, I had to teach all the scouts how to how to sell. And I would I told them that if you can't sell a box of something, then just ask them if they'd be willing to donate a dollar or, or 50 cents or two dollars or whatever. And there was this one guy, I remember him walking up the driveway and the guy had met him about halfway down the driveway and he's telling him about the product and asking if he wanted. And the guy said, no, I'm, just, I'm not going to buy any. And he turned around before Harrison could say anything more. And Harrison followed him up and said, excuse me, sir, sir. And he's tapping on him going, could you just give a dollar? You don't, I mean, could you at least do that? And I think the guy ended up piling a five out and giving it to him because he just, you know, he was so persistent and, and very tactful and, and polite about it, but he, he didn't let him get away without something, you know? So anyway. I remember you tell, telling them that, you know, they're not selling popcorn, they're selling the scouts and what they do in the organization and, 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 you know, and um, yeah, you, you, you taught those, those, those kids a lot of skills that can be useful in so many areas, even if you don't work in sales, just so many areas of life and, and as an adult. And so these, you know, kids, we often label as challenging, spirited, that have these intense qualities, intense energy or persistence, or you, you can come up with all kinds of labels and they can feel exhausting to you as a parent, especially when they're young. And yet these qualities are the things that can make exceptional employees or entrepreneurs in different areas of life, like being persistent. Um, well, we thought, you know, you and I talked about that we, we, wanted to raise our kids to be independent, which I think most parents do. And that that takes a lot different than what most people think. But I remember, you know, when they would question us or we'd ask them to do something and then they'd question us as to why or whatever. And we get a little frustrated because we didn't grow up with that kind of opportunity. And it was hard for us to to deal with that, even though we knew and and we would let them express and ask questions but it was really tough because we didn't grow up that way we didn't grow up you know being allowed to necessarily we, were told. we did what we were told and i i yeah. remember my mother saying you know when you are an adult when you have your own house and your old family then you can make up the rules and you can decide you know what to do. <laughs> and i remember standing there like wait a minute i have my own house and my own family and i'm the adult <laughs> 
yet my kids are questioning and, and they're making yet, the rules darn it <laughs> so it was a new avenue and yet I wanted to give them that voice to feel heard and to be able to explore and and discover and you know I had great parents and yeah I did too I mean they 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 were doing the best they knew how the way they knew how and uh now they they we both had a had parents that that were there with love even though they you know some of the ways they did it weren't maybe the the best way or something but they oh, did we all make mistakes we all make yeah. mistakes and we're all coming from different places and different times and you know generations and all of that and so you know i just there were things that i wanted to do differently and you know like I said before, all kids are differently. And, and um, so I'm just going to read a few more of these things that I've learned um, from my kids and my cats. The cat is rubbing on the microphone right now. Hiking heals the soul. The view at the top of the mountains is worth climbing past the danger sign. The first time at the beach is the best time. Going to the beach is even more fun with children. Digging in the sand is calming and satisfying. Straws kill sea turtles. Don't let people tell you that you cannot hike 20 miles in one hike. If you love <laughs> hiking, don't allow people to convince you that you should be a swimmer or a biker. Learning to ride a bike is not a requirement for adulthood. School changes how you look at learning. Life experience is more meaningful than a college degree. Don't waste your time trying to be something that you are not. And so on that note, just giving you all something to think about, we're going to talk more on this topic intermittently as we do our podcast. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and your questions, you know, especially speaking to these ideas with people who kids go to traditional school, parents who both work full time. Um, although we have, I've, for most of my children's upbringing, I have worked at least part time outside the home. I'm worried the cat's going to knock things over right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we'd love to hear more from you so that we can expand on this topic. So that is our podcast for today. Like I said, we'd love to hear from you. Be sure to leave a comment give us feedback, write a review, wherever you're listening to this podcast, please share it with others. You can learn more about Don and I and our parent coaching program, the work we're doing with the sandwich generation, our parent communication classes, and our upcoming workshops at focusedhealthyfamily.com. From there, you can read the blogs, Find all our podcasts, including the Tuesday Tips podcast that we air each week that are a short 15 minutes or less podcast. You can find us on Facebook at Focused Healthy Family, Instagram, Gina at Focused Healthy Family. <laughs> I can't. And remember, how you speak to your children today shapes their future and yours. Take care.